Welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host, Ethan Nagel, and today we have an amazing podcast with a buddy of mine, Jeff Reed, who is a former Navy SEAL and now a professional dog musher up in Alaska. And I'm super pumped to bring him on and tell his story and uh, have him on as a guest. So, Jeff, thanks for coming on to the uh, Nine Line podcast. Heck yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll kind of start with a, a little bit of an origin story. Where are you from and what got you into the SEAL teams? So originally from Martinsburg, Pennsylvania, it's a small little dairy farming community right in the heart of Pennsylvania, right in central Pennsylvania. Uh, I joined the Navy right at 18. So as soon as I finished high school, kind of went right into, into the Navy, signed a BUDS contract that guaranteed me a spot to go to the BUDS. Um, the reason I chose Navy SEAL route was uh, since I was a little kid, I had uh, – always looked up to my grandfather. My grandfather served in the army and was in the Korean war and was a recipient recipient of the uh, bronze star with valor. And every time I'd go over to his house or, or hang out with him, I was like in awe of this guy. And my grandfather told me stories of his time that the army and, and uh, always looked up to him and always wanted to kind of like serve and, and, go down that path of, of like fighting war and, and being a warrior. And then after 9-11 happened, I was in seventh grade. So I was pretty young when 9-11 happened. Um, finished out high school. And whenever it came time to try to figure out what path I'm going to go on next, I had no clue what the heck I was going to do. So the military definitely was more attractive than going to school for me. But I didn't want to just kind of like uh, take any job in the military. I wanted to pick a job that would guarantee me a uh, – front front row seat to the action and kind of get me overseas and downrange as quick as possible. Um, so I talked to my grandfather about that, what I should do. And he's like, you should go in and talk to uh, the army recruiter and try to go with the green beret route. And so that's what I did. I went and talked to an army recruiter and the army recruiter told me that there was no way that I would be able to go right out of boot camp into um, SF selection that I could do other things like maybe go work as a mechanic or do something. And then after a few years of doing that, kind of put in my package to get, go to the selection that did not really, is not really what I wanted to do. I kind of wanted to go right into it. So I looked around at different branches and then um, I talked to the Navy and they had the seal route where you could join a seal on the seal contract and uh, right out of buds or right out of basic training, go right in the buds and, then that's what I did, kind of signed up. And a few months later, I shipped off to basic training. Awesome. So uh, how many deployments did you while you're in? Like, so did you spend, you, I believe you spent like eight years in, correct? Or around that yeah, time? Yeah, right around now. I, I got out just a little bit over nine years. Um, I ended up doing two deployments. Both of them were, were vastly different, but both were in Afghanistan. My first deployment to Afghanistan was in the southern part in Kandahar. And my second deployment was in the Argandab River Valley. Hey guys, quick break from the podcast. I had to show you our new drops coming out August the 25th. Now these are only available for two weeks. Got the silent but deadly. Our black hoodie. Got coffee? Surrender is not in my vocabulary. It's certainly not in ours. It's not mine, that's for sure. Two amazing classics featured on our new tribe lens. We got the five things and the classic D-Tom. Pick them up August 25th. Only going to be good for two weeks, so make sure you get yours and enjoy your podcast. Yeah, and I, I remember talking with you. We, we've talked before. I know it, it was a lot different of a mission than typical direct action. What like seals are known for? Um, I think we kind of bonded over that. I was a combat advisor, and I. What was it that the seals did that was more in the combat advisor role that you filled? Can you kind of break yeah, that down? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, so my first deployment, we were actually slotted to go to Europe. I was going to be the Yukon deployment and probably like a week or two before we were actually going to deploy, we all got called into the troop hut and like, Hey guys, we got some big news. We're actually no longer going to Europe. We're going to be going to Afghanistan, which is like the greatest news for any kind of team guy that wants to go down range. So we were super pumped, but it was like, but here's, here's what's going to happen. We're taking on this new mission set. It was uh, VSO. We were village stability operations. And essentially what that was is you deploy to a remote location and embed into a village. And you kind of live in the vi village amongst the villagers. And you kind of are there as like um, building 
a local police unit, working with the local Afghan army and kind of expanding out and try to push out any kind of bad guys out of that area and kind mm-hmm. of make your green zone, the friendly zone kind of bigger and kind of ex- expand the presence of American forces in these remote places. Um, yeah, it was the first, first, as far as I know, we were one of the first uh, SEAL platoons to ever do that mission. That's more of like an army SF Green Beret type mission. Uh, mm-hmm. But we took it and we were super pumped to do it, man. And and we got down there. So like the the, the big difference between like that and like the oper the ops and deployments of past the past team guys, some of the older guys we were with was these guys were coming from Iraq where it was mostly DA, you know, capture, kill, kicking in doors, um, mm-hmm. flexing onto another target, hitting another house, and then heading back to the the site at your your base after that and kind of rejock. This was you're you're literally living in it. Like you, there's no escaping it. You're living in this remote village. You're kind of unsupported. We didn't have any any of the amenities that the big bases had. So like we had no running water. All of our food had to be cooked over an open fire. We had no internet. Like friends of mine were able to FaceTime and Skype with their families back home. If we wanted to call home, we had to whip out the sat phone and call them the sat phone. Um, so it's just a very different type of mission set that what most team guys were were used to at the time is so was that like a culture shock for you like say some of your older guys like this is this is your first kind of deployment going into it i mean that's a a hell of an introduction you know like i always tell guys that like my first deployment was very much down and dirty it almost on that you know on that same line and a lot of people aren't used to seals talking about that you know it's like and even like you know we we knew them as well we saw them a lot in the chow halls <laughs> you know yeah. and like al Assad and doing raids and coming back and eating ice cream and hitting the gym you know so is that was that a little bit of culture shock for like say you or even some of the older guys that were kind of coming in like holy shit this isn't this isn't quite our mission or you know what we typically do how would how did you guys adapt to that yeah, so the guys that were – the last deployment they did was, was in Iraq. It was definitely way different than that. Mm-hmm. Um, but we were – like I said, we were supposed to go to Europe where essentially in Europe all you do is drink beer and train with other countries. So it's, it was nice that we were actually getting away from that and still doing something downrange, you know, doing the actual – like going into the war. So mm-hmm. – we were both very, very excited about everybody on the platoon was very excited at the last minute. We're like, yeah, we're not going to Europe anymore. We're actually heading to Afghanistan. So that was cool. The attitude towards some of the other guys were like, yeah, but this isn't the mission set of SEALs. we got to be careful taking this because then we'll ju- we're going to be doing less of actual DA, which is what we're supposed to be doing anyway. Me, on the other hand, I was pumped, dude. I, I was pumped, one, to get just be in Afghanistan as a SEAL, and then two – when we deployed out and we went to our site, man, it was like we were no longer under the microscope. We were essentially like unleashed and it was up to us as a small unit to work to figure out if we had problems, it was on us to figure it out. We had no real, like we had support, but it was very minimal. It was, it was hard to get in and out of our base. And, uh, but like, yeah, so everything we had was relying on us as far as like gathering Intel, building, uh, building mission packages and and then just survival like living the day-to-day life out there was all based on us so we didn't have a like we didn't have someone like cooking our meals all the time we didn't have we weren't relying on a cook we were weren't relying on cvs it was all kind of uh internal into our own platoon to kind of fix any problem that arise there's a lot of different stuff, a lot of different um, training aspects that we weren't expecting. Like we had to build a base from scratch, which none of us are builders. We're not CBs or anything like that, but we had to kind of figure it all out on the fly and and uh, putting together like guys with backgrounds before the teams. Like, oh yeah, I did construction for a few years. I know how to build this and do this, and oh, I know how to work on this vehicle. I can I can figure this out. And so there's a lot of like figuring out on the fly for us. Yeah, that's awesome. We had the kind of the same thing too. We had a combat engineer, but he was like heavy equipment. Mm-hmm. So he knew how to build, actually build. It wasn't like just explosive combat engineer. It was like, oh no, he was heavy equipment. He could absolutely build stuff for us. So we, that, that that always helps having guys with, on the team that have that type of experience. So you do your two deployments and then 
you know, it's time to reenlist or it's time to go, you know, I, I heard some guys, it's kind of like, you know, either try out for, for green t- or not green team, but for, you know, team six, or you try, you know, moving forward with that or what kind of, you know, made you say, Hey, you know, this is, I'm out, you know, especially after like nine years, you know, like it's a lot of time that's a, you know, to be in the teams and, and to do two deployments like yours and pretty intensive at that, you know, what was, you know, your thought process on being like, Hey, you know, this isn't for me anymore. Yeah. When I first got into the SEAL teams, man, it was like, it was still a little bit of the good old days were left. You know, when I showed up the platoon spaces and each troop hut all had uh, a fully stocked bar in it. And like uniform of the day was, you know, board shorts, flip flops, tank top, work out, get your stuff done and go home. And I could see it after my first deployment, things started really changing, like kind of going downhill from the, like the big boy roles that the, everyone says is in the SEAL teams. So then they eventually, like everything, got like no more bars in the in the troop space. Uh, we actually had uniform of the day. It went from focusing on training to now there's all these NKOs, Navy Knowledge Online, and had to take all these uh, general military classes. It, it just, the bullshit kept getting piled on, on as time went on. And then, um, so my first deployment was very IED heavy, and uh, we didn't get in a whole lot of gunfights. And then we, we, I redeployed from that deployment and we did another workup. Workup went great, had a blast with the dudes, did a, the second deployment in the, in the Argandal River Valley. And that was a very kinetic deployment. And I got to do everything, you know, you think of what a Navy SEAL would do downrange. And, and that was awesome. That was exactly what I wanted to be doing. And, but during that deployment, we got pulled out of our site because they deemed the juice wasn't worth the squeeze. It wasn't worth the reward because we were getting in gunfights almost every day. And uh, we had a couple Afghan dudes get killed and a couple of our uh, 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 sister platoon get members get killed too as well. Kevin Everett and uh, Matt Cantor were, were killed during that deployment. And uh, they, they yanked us out. And I could kind of see the writing on the wall there that uh, the war was – winding down from a kinetic level it just wasn't going to be the same the days of running and gunning were, were numbered and the thought of getting out doing or get redeploying back to the states jumping back in another platoon doing an intensive workup to deploy to essentially not fight a war ever again that really was tough for me to to, to do and and stay motivated so that's kind of when i started thinking like ah maybe i have to start thinking of what's next on the horizon for me. Cause if I wasn't, a, if I was going to be a seal, I wanted to be a seal that was going to go down range and fight war. If there was no war to fight, I was going to look for different pastures. Kind of. So what, what years was that? Uh, kind of like, my it, first it, I mean, deployment like it's, it got, was yeah. 08 to 09. And then my second deployment was 2012. Mm-hmm. Which makes sense. I mean, I was in Afghanistan as a contractor, 2012 to 2013 in Kabul. And yep. that was definitely like what you're saying, like that was felt across the board. Um, in fact, that that was the election time, you know, 2012 election and everyone's minds was Afghanistan. Like, you know, it was like, do we stay? Are we getting out? I do remember them being like, be ready to pack up your shit and go home because – politically they might just pull out like you know we might not be here anymore um and so you could feel the drawdown a little bit you know like you can kind of feel that like hey are we leaving are we staying like what's going on with the budgets you know and and everything was kind of touch and go obviously we stayed for another you know eight years (laughs) but yeah but i agree with you though even even hearing guys post 2012 2013 the kinetics really started to drop you know and i think uh you know american forces started kind of sheltering in place you know at their fobs and so a lot of guys weren't getting kinetics or if it was it was sf teams and then even sf teams towards the end were just you know hey we're not going out of the wire we've been told not to you know that's just the name of the game and uh, but yeah so i and i agree with you i i, I completely understand that if you're not going to be in the military fighting wars then you know what's the point like i i, I totally understand that so yeah, when we're it uh, out of my second deployment there and to, to relocate us closer to bases, like, okay, well, we were just here for four months, like literally getting shot at every day, bases attacked every day. It's like, mm-hmm. we're lucky no one got seriously hurt. And if they did, like, it was worth nothing now. Like, we just, we were literally doing good work. And then all of a sudden mm-hmm. they're like, yeah, you guys got to leave. It's not worth it anymore. So it's like, okay, well, if it's not worth it, then <laughs> yeah. we just literally wasted four months. Yeah, so. exactly. Like, yeah, especially all the time and effort you guys put into it. So, 
now that you're, you know, you're saying, Hey, you know, you're seeing the writing on the wall. How do you evolve then going from, you know, going from that into the civilian life? That's always a big question. A guy's like, you know, what, you know, how'd you find your path or how'd you, how'd you figure that out? Yeah. So to really to answer that question, I have to go back to my first deployment. Mm-hmm. Sort of my first deployment, I rescued a dog in Afghanistan named Frank. And after my first deployment, Frank went on and, and lived with, with my wife and my mom and dad, like split the difference between those two places. And then uh, whenever I finished my second deployment, I kind of made the decision that I wasn't going to stay in anymore, but I still had about two years left of my contract before I was able to, to bounce out of the Navy. And so I got put into trade ed. I went to the training detachment where I taught land warfare. And every time I would go down to teach a class in, in land warfare, uh, Frank would come with me. He became like my service dog. And, and I spent every second of every day with that dog. And a uh, few months before I went to get out of the Navy, he took off chasing after a cat and ran across the road and was hit by a car and was killed. And uh, Frank was more than a dog to me. Uh, he was like, he was the one thing that I had, like, I don't that when I was going to get out, he was the one th- I wasn't, like, when you get out, the, the train keeps moving all like the, you lose your tribe, essentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, Frank was at least a little bit of that that was going to come with me on my transition out. And whenever he was killed, it took a huge piece of me with it, with him. And uh, I just kept thinking, like, there's no way I'll ever have another dog where I have that that bond that me and Frank had, you know, like from just deployments and, and the whole thing of trying to get him home was crazy just to, you know, cause I ended up smuggling him back in plain view. Um, but yeah, so when I lost him, it took a huge piece. It's like the wind out of my sails, man. And, uh, I didn't really have a plan of what I was actually going to do when I got out. I just knew that I was going to find something else. My wife at the time was in, um, going to school up in Clarkson university up in upstate New York. And when I got out, I moved up with her to try to figure out kind of my next, next, next thing. Uh, she kept trying to talk me into getting another dog. And I was like, no, I don't really want to get another dog. And, and I was just kind of like going nowhere fast. You know, I was, I wasn't on the right path. Didn't have anything really figured out. And, and I was kind of like a lost ship. Uh, anyway, she ended up nagging on me, nagging on me, trying to get me to get a dog. And finally I, it's like, fine. We're, we were renting a place at the time. And she's like, if I was like, if you can convince our landlord to let us get a dog, we'll get a freaking dog. Sure as shit. She did. She, she talked to the landlord. We ended up getting a dog. And, uh, so we had a dog and then I started like, we got a little puppy then and her name's Eleanor, who's still out here, the biggest floofiest dog that we have. Um, anyway, after having that dog for a little bit, she, she talked to me a little bit like, well, what, what is it that you want to do? Like if you could, could figure out to do anything in the world, what is it that you would want to do? And I thought a little bit about that and like, you know, what would be really awesome is to move up to Alaska, get a sled dog team and run the I did rod. And she looked at me for a second and was like, well, if you can figure out a plan to make that actual reality, then we'll do it. And so that's all I needed to hear, dude. And I started right then trying to figure it out, how to make it a reality, how to make it work financially for her, for us, you know, for everyone. And uh, so what I did is I Googled all dog mushing kennels, in Alaska and uh, found a, a list of like 25 of them and sent out a mass email to them all and heard back from a few of them and ended up locking in a job with one of them. And she, as she was getting ready to, to graduate school, she was sending out applications to Alaska to try to find a job up here. She locked down a job. I locked down a job and she's like, well, I guess if we're going to do it, now's the time to do it. And uh, we decided that we were going to move up to Alaska For five years, you know, like if we get up there and we hate it, you know, home's always going to be there. We can always move home anytime we want. It's never going to get easier to do it than now because we didn't have kids. We essentially both had blank slates to start from. So that's what we did, man. We we loaded up. I had a a pickup truck and a trailer and I loaded everything, all of our possessions down in that thing. And we we left Pennsylvania and drove northwest to Alaska. (laughs) That's amazing. So, I mean dog mushings how did that idea that 
idea get in, even get into your head? I mean, that's pretty wild. If someone was like, "Hey, what do you want to do?" A, a dog mushy, not saying it would be, you know, what you know. It's just one of the farthest ideas from my head. I would have came up with like scuba diving or something, or, yeah, or, or yeah. something else. You know, uh, like how did yeah. you evolve into into dog mushing? Yeah, so. It goes back to the, my dog, Frank, that I rescued from Afghanistan. We had, I was so close to that dog, man, that I, I don't even know if I can put it into words, the, how close I was to that dog. It was, he was a special, special dog. And, you know, I thought, I thought about like the only way, like there's no way I'd ever form a bond like I had with Frank. And then I read a book by Gary Paulson called Winter Dance about his um, I did a rod run. And it's, when I read that, I was like, unless I do something like that. And I'm very much a guy who loves outdoors, camping, hunting, fishing, wilderness. And I love dogs. When you combine all those things together, you get dog mushing. So like, I was trying to think like, what is it that I actually want to do that I like to do? I like dogs. I like outdoors. I like traveling. I like ca camping. And, and I was like, when you mix all those together, man, that's, that's dog mushing. And if, if I'm being honest, that's and when Jerry asked me, like, when she asked me, like, what is it that I want to do? That's what went through my head. I was like, I like this. I like this. I like this. Well, that's dog mushing. Move to Alaska. That, that'd be cool. So that's kind of how I pitched it to her. And then when she was like, if you if you want to do that, you got to come up with a plan. And then if, once I realized that she was, she could be on board with this if I come up with the right plan, that's whenever I went like full speed, full speed ahead, dove into it, man. Um, but essentially what it came down to is trying to find a, a bond, trying to bond with dogs again. And the only way to do that is by doing some crazy adventures. And, and, uh, that's how dog mushing kind of came about in my head. <laughs> so what was the, what was the five, did you guys pass your five year cut up, cut off mark already? Yeah. This was our sixth winter. Yep. <laughs> We moved oh, nice. up okay. with one dog. So first, now we have 25 dogs and two kids, and we, we have no intention of moving back to Pennsylvania anytime soon. So that's awesome, and and that's that's pretty rare though too. I mean, to, one to have your wife say, "Yeah, let's give this a shot." Two to have your wife say, "Yeah, I I don't want to move back. This is a, I love being up in Alaska because you know I love the outdoors too, but I'm also I love you know being around you know minnesota and twin cities <laughs> yeah you know whatnot so yeah but to, to to commit to that so that's pretty awesome i mean did you guys ever have any kind of like we don't know if this is going to work out or we don't know you know how this is going especially like it, i mean that's got to be a shock i mean it's not like moving to california or moving to idaho or moving to montana this is alaska like the days get shorter the days get longer you know the winters are incredibly harsh at times you can you know you're very remote even in you know even visiting you guys out in fairbanks and twin rivers that's you know for some people that's that's pretty damn remote you know so how was that like even though you guys were hey you're a team you're in on it you know but did you guys face any of the kind of those challenges a little bit of culture shock yeah maybe the first the first one it was a little bit a culture shock not so much maybe for me um what happens is it's not necessarily the cold that gets people in Alaska. I mean, it does get cold. I mean, there's this year, I think the coldest it got down to was 50, 55 below zero. Um, but then that's cold. That will, that'll definitely be a shock to some people. But what really mm -hmm. gets people is the darkness. It stays dark in the heart of the winter. We get three hours and 45 minutes of daylight and the sun literally comes up over the horizon and just stays mm -hmm. right at the horizon and drops down. It's not like it's like full bright, sunny days. It's sunrise, mm -hmm. sunset, for three hours and uh the what really gets people are the, the people that go to work and it's dark and they come home and it's dark those people have the hardest time me i'm outside all day every day with the dog so i i get to see the sun come up and get to see the sunset i'm out in the sun outside and it doesn't really change anything for me so like for me it wasn't that big of a deal but like jerry who who works at the time she worked at the emergency department in fairbanks um she, she kind of had maybe a little bit of harder time because she was, you know, inside with the fluorescent lighting and not actually getting sun on her face. And, and that's, that's what the, that tends to be a little bit difficult for people, but it changes so quick. So really from November to January, it's really dark, but by the time February comes around, the sun starts coming up. And you, when he starts, once it starts getting above the horizon and it starts hitting you, you're like, Oh man, it feels so good. You don't realize I missed it that much until it starts hitting you. And then right now we have daylight till about 1030. So we have, it goes the opposite in the summertime. We have 24 hours of daylight. And right now we're, we get daylight till about 1030. So it does change quick. It's just this, those few months are like, 
the, the, you can definitely feel the, the less energy that you get from not having sun. That's probably the hardest thing. Yeah. Yeah. So what was that uh, challenge? And I mean, like you, so you started interning slash working with this dog kennel. When did you take the step and say, I'm buying my own dogs or however that process works? Can you kind of fill us in on that? Like kind of like soup to nuts, like wouldn't, you know, yeah. you're, I don't have anything. How do I become a dog musher? Yeah. So I, I moved up to Alaska to get into dog mushing, never having gone dog mushing in my life. I never even harnessed a sled dog before. I've just read books, watched a few movies. I knew what it was about and I liked everything about it. So when I moved up here with no experience, never being around it before, I had to at least find mentors to help me out. So that's whenever I, I reached out to all those dog mushers and asked them if they needed help for the season. Essentially, I was willing to trade um, knowledge for work. Like I didn't want, I wasn't after making money. I was just after the knowledge. So I, one of the, I, the, the kennel I ended up deciding to work for was SP kennel. Um, it's ran by, was ran by Ali Zirkel and Alan Moore, uh, both husband and wife, um, team that ran, both ran the Iditarod and then Alan would run the Yukon quest. And they, they essentially let me come on that whole, whole year to help, train their dogs and kind of be their handler for the year. So the first day I worked for them, I went there and all I did was scoop dog shit. You know, I was a, I was a shit picker upper and then I would feed dogs and then that lasted maybe for a week. And then, um, as they, they saw how eager I was to learn and that I was at least a little bit capable of things, they let me do moved up to the harness and dog. They showed me how to harness the dogs and hook the dogs up to their, their line as they were getting ready to go out for runs. And then eventually I was on the back of the four wheeler when they were going out for runs and I was watching how they kind of handled everything. And then I was on my own four wheeler for a little bit. Then as snow came, we kind of transitioned from four wheelers to uh, running on sleds. And then Alan had got sick and wasn't able to run dogs for a few, few months. And actually uh, that kind of made them force them to let me take on a bigger role and while Alan was recovering, Allie was kind of helping him. It kind of put a lot of pressure on me to get their dogs trained up. So it was like, essentially, I was like drinking through a fire hose, trying to get all that knowledge in and keeping their dogs up. And and I learned a lot that winter. Alan went on and actually won the Yukon Quest that year. So I got to learn how to train dogs to, to a caliber that is going to win these races and events. And I learned like, what to do, what, biggest thing is what not to do and, and uh, feeding programs, you know, like mm-hmm. I learned so much just in that one year that I almost like, I didn't know the questions to ask until after the season was over almost, but I learned enough yeah. to get on my own and I learned the basics. But through Allie and Allen, I met a guy named Sebastian Schnuley and we, I was actually over at Allie and Allen's house drinking coffee one morning. We were getting ready to go out for a dog run and Sebastian came up on a snow machine and uh so sebastian was a german dog musher who was a past uh yukon quest champion and second place i did rod finisher and he was getting ready to retire from dog mushing and he came over to Allie and allen's house and was like hey i'm looking to to get out of dog mushing i want to leave which is a suitcase because i'm moving to a sailboat i want to leave everything at the house there i just need to find like the right person that that wants to buy the place my, my property He's like oh i know a guy And, uh, so that day after we were done drinking coffee, I went over to his house and he kind of gave me a tour of his property. And he kind of told me like, yeah, he's leaving with a suitcase. He has six dogs here. He's going to leave. And he's like, it it was like, I, I, I want to buy this place from you. So after I got done with the day, went back, talked to Jerry about it. She came out and saw the property. And then as soon as she saw it, we decided to put an offer in and that became the new spot for frozen trident kennel. And that's, we moved in later on that February. So that's how we kind of got our own place. And, and whenever we moved in, I always tell people, it's like we moved into the whole dog musher starter kit. We moved in, it had six dogs, six sled dogs, with really good genetics, really good sled dogs, the harnesses, the line, sleds, four wheeler, plow truck. Like I could literally move in and that next, that day I could start running my own dog team. So that's, <laughs> that's amazing. We, yeah. That's kind yeah, of how yeah. we ended up with this place here. And the cool Mm -hmm. thing about Two Rivers, Alaska, is it's right along the Yukon Quest Trail. And I can leave my backyard, get right on the the Yukon Quest Trail. There's over a thousand miles of trails, public access, that I can train and run dogs out. And and I could run a dog team all the way out to the Yukon Territory if I wanted to into Canada. 
over a thousand miles of trail. So in order to train for the Iditarod, you need to have three to 5,000 miles on your team. And this is like an easy spot to have all that trail access to get that miles on. Yeah. I'd imagine. I mean, that's, that's huge, especially with the amount of ground you guys are covering. I mean, it's like ultra marathon running with, you know, six, eight dogs, and then you're, you know, you're having your breaks and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, how challenging is it? I know, uh, congratulations. I know you finished the Yukon and now you are qualified for the, or, you know, you can enter the Iditarod. How was that journey then covering those miles? You know, it, it took a few years to get to where you are now just to compete in the Iditarod. So what was the challenges that you faced and, you know, how difficult it is it? to, to cover those miles. Yeah. So there's, there's, monsters will do several different things in order to qualify for the Iditarod. So the Iditarod, you can't just sign up and decide, you know what, I'm going to do the Iditarod. So you have to qualify for it in order to qualify. You need to have a 200 mile race completed and two 300 mile races completed. And when you do those 200, 300 mile races, you get a report card and you have the head vet and the race marshal kind of grading you off on your dog care, um, how, your cold weather survival skills and all that. They, probably, they just want to make sure you're not going to be a, a liability out there when it comes time for you to run the thousand mile plus races. And uh, so in my start, when you start off running or starting a kennel off, no one sells you their best dogs for obvious reasons, right? That no one's going to give you their best dog because they want them for themselves. So anytime you go to buy dogs, you're either going to be very selective or ask like, why is it that you want to sell this dog? Why, why don't you want to keep him? Or you end up buying puppies and raising them up until they're old enough to become uh, old enough sled dogs or mature sled dogs, or you buy older dogs and use those like proven older dogs that have won races in the past or finished well in the past and use those genetics to pass on to future, uh, dogs down the line. And we kind of did a little bit of both. I bought some puppies and, and I got some older dogs. And, uh, so it took a little bit of time for me to grow a kennel of dogs all in their prime, ready to run these longer distances. That was the first thing that kind of happened. So once we kind of had our, our team together, we start, We did our first 300-mile race. I believe that was in 2019, and we we did great. The dogs did great. Uh, it was, we finished and finished with a great-looking team, and then we started having kids, and that really kind of mm-hmm. took us back a little bit. And then the dogs that we had in our prime after having taken two or three years off, you know, dogs age pretty quickly in two to three years versus people Mm -hmm. so some of those dogs that were in their prime when i did my last 300 mile race were no longer in their prime so i had to kind of start the process all over again so we had to have a few more litters and now they just got back all those litters that we had now are now old enough to start competing again and uh so that was kind of the big the big break that in between it took us a while so yeah just just uh one it took us a while to grow a team and then we started growing our own family and then i took a little bit two years off from from running races and then I got back into it again this year, which qualified us. But uh, for people that want to get into dog mushing, there's there's ways to do it a lot faster. If you lease a team, you can buy or lease teams from other mushers. But I kind of wanted to do it my way as far as like having my own dogs and, and growing my own dog team. There's just something, you know, I think it's more enjoyable mushing whenever they're your, your own dog and you you raise them from the time they were little puppies that fit in your palm of your hand and, mm-hmm. and watch and can remember the day that they were born. And it's, that's what's special to me about dog mushing and doing it with my own team. I, I gotta imagine that bond then is pretty strong. I mean, if you are raising them from puppies and you're, you know, you're the multi-generation per se, you know, uh, pretty quickly with the litters, you know, uh, and working and knowing every single, you know, every single nook and cranny of the dogs and how they act. And, you know, I remember when I was up there with you, you know, you're like, well, this one's a leader or we're training this one to be a leader. She stuck out. This one didn't, you know, like how important is that? You know, it's when, especially when you start getting group dynamics of dogs together, you know, you hear about wolves and the alpha and then the pack. I mean, I, I got to imagine you're dealing with the, you know, evolutionary you know biology of dogs and then you're <laughs> to go race these you know massive distance and using that to your advantage so uh, you know i gotta imagine that you guys are all pretty close i mean how is that then working with them and and, and you know is it frustrating at times or you know do, do they pick up on it pretty quick or how is that yeah i mean there's definitely times where it can get frustrating especially if the dogs aren't behaving the way you want them to behave but you got to keep keep in mind that they're dogs and how you react in certain mm-hmm. certain situations 
can snowball to bigger events. So like if you're frustrated, the dogs will definitely pick up on that. And then the dogs get frustrated if you're frustrated or if you're, if you're in a situation where you're scared, the dogs can pick up on that energy and then start acting badly or performing in a bad, bad manner. So like you keep in control of the emotions, even if, even, even if it's like false motivation and, and at times you kind of have to keep that, that kind of in mind as you, you go about your day with the dogs. But, uh, the big thing that like, I spend so much time with these dogs that I know, uh, if, if a dog would bark out in the dog yard right now, I could tell you the name of that dog barking. I know the ins and outs of each dog. I know which dog, I know a dog's who they like, who their best friends are, what they don't like. Um, yeah, I know these dogs so well cause I spend every day with them out there. And uh, a lot of times, like I can let all my dogs loose and I don't have fights because I can read their body languages really well. If their hackles are raised and they start doing a, uh, they're shaking their tail in a nervous manner. And I could see two dogs kind of like squaring off each other. If I just say, Hey Johnny, and just that'll snap them out and look back at me and that would prevent a fight. If I wasn't out there and didn't say that there'd be a big fight that would happen. So like there's different things that I can kind of pick up on the dogs where they start acting a little bit different then I can kind of like redirect them in a, in a way to help alleviate any kind of bad behavior. Um, and then the other thing is like you were talking about leaders and, and, and uh, important is that, like that is honestly one of the most important positions of the team because the leader is the one going to get the, the team to go through certain things. And there's obstacles on the trail. A lot of times there's sometimes there's open water, even at 40 below zero, there can be open water on some of the trails. Um, there can be icy situations, there can be steep hills and having the right dog with the right mentality to go through some of those things can really be the, uh, uh, a difference between getting frustrated and not getting frustrated. You know, if a dog sees it open water and he doesn't want to go through it and then you have the wrong dog and lead and they stop and it causes a huge, uh, cording effect. And then you have a big tangle that can cause some frustration. So, uh, just knowing what the trail conditions are going to be up ahead and having the right, um, dog pair combo in front and, and, and the rest of the team will really kind of alleviate any problems. So logistically, how does that like each race, like, I guess I got to imagine the dog food, the length of the time, the hydration, the rest, like, you know, how long do these races typically last? Yeah. So the 300 mile race we did in three days, um, in three days we traveled 300 miles and each checkpoint, there's a checkpoint every 50 to 75 miles along the race. And each checkpoint is, is nothing more than a resupply point. So you can either stay and, and rest in those checkpoints or you can grab your, your resupply and go. And, and each checkpoint, there's dog booties, which cover the dog's paws. There's extra, there's a uh, kibble for the dogs to eat, meat snacks, um, human food, human gloves, socks, boots, and everything. So you kind of strategically plan what you're going to need at each checkpoint to help get you to the next checkpoint. And then you get to the next checkpoint and that checkpoint, what you grab there is going to help you get to the next checkpoint. And that's kind of how you strategically plan it. And at the beginning of the race, um, a few weeks pr- before the race, prior to the race, you have all your checkpoints or your, your uh, bags set up. So that way someone else will deliver them to these checkpoints. So that way you don't have to do it. It's already there for you when you get there. Oh, okay. Awesome. I, I do remember you saying though, that like you can't, or like you only, you can, do touch the dog or how was that working? I remember you said planning wise, like Jerry, cause Jerry helps you out and your family. Does that it, it, like, she can only do so much, correct? Like, it's like, you have to like get the dogs down, but they can only set up so much for you according to the rules. Like what, what was that again? Yeah. So from the start of the race, the only person that's able to care for the dogs is a dog musher. So a 50 mile leg, if your ideal run is going to take you about five hours, because the, the sweet spot where you want to travel with the dogs is anywhere from eight to 10 miles an hour, at least for me, that's mm-hmm. where I like the, the speed I like to travel with them. So perfect trail conditions and everything, we're going to get 50 miles in five hours. And then when you get to a, a checkpoint, you're going to rest. And usually you rest anywhere from three to six hours. And if you're there for three hours, you're not getting, the musher's not getting any rest because you have to take all the dog booties off. So what I do when I get to a checkpoint, I'll just give you my whole checkpoint routine. If, when I'm when I get to a checkpoint, the very first thing I do is I lay out straw for the dogs. And the reason I lay out straw for the dogs is the dogs are trained to see the straw laid out. That's like, okay, we're going to be here for a while. They'll start to lay down almost immediately. Once the dogs are all lay, laying down and bedded down, I'll go through the line and take off all their dog booties. And then once all their dog booties are off, it's time to start cooking their meal. And we have a dog cooker. It's a little uh, square cooker with an insert that runs off of heat, which is methanol. 
and you put methanol in, into the, the reservoir, you light it, and then you set the insert inside of it and you start shoveling snow in the insert. And then the heat will melt the snow and then eventually boil the water. And then I have a cooler full of kibble and, and uh, a uh, meat snacks and stuff. And I'll dump the hot boiling water in that and turn it into a soup. And uh, that way the dogs will get a warm, wet meal, which will help with hydration as well. Um, three hours, you're just getting finished with everything, prepping the next set of booties to go on your next run. So within three hours, there's no rest. Four mm-hmm. hours, there's really no rest. Five to six hours, you might get one, one to two hours of rest in that. So, like, the uh, the Yukon Quest 300 that I did, I got three hours of sleep in the three days that I was out there. So, it's not a whole lot of rest for the mushers because you're take, constantly caring for the dogs and, like, making sure the dogs have what they need to get you to the next checkpoint and to the next checkpoint. And So, it's definitely a lot of work, but th- that's where it's, like, the the – the handlers, they want to help because they see the mushers like in a sleep deprived kind of funk, maybe not like what Jerry does help me with is like, you forgot, you forgot a booty on this dog or something like if I'm that sleep deprived where I'm not, you know, firing all cylinders, she'll help me. Like you forgot this, or you're not doing this right. Or she'll t- let me know that that's kind of what I need to help redirect me in any way I need to be redirected. So I got to imagine then that, that the sleep deprivation, um, is it, does that help them like come from the from the seals you could always like fall back on like oh yeah we've always had it just as bad or for, you know worse i mean that's my thing is uh my wife notices like if i get tired i go straight to bed like it could be in the middle of like having friends over so i'm like i'm out like you know i've been to to hell and back with like everything and even sleep deprivation but that's one thing i don't tolerate like in, the, in unless i'm like working or doing something like like what you're doing you know but like in my day-to-day life if i start feeling like i'm trying to fight some sort of sleep i'm going straight to bed like there's no there's no, yeah. there's no issue with that so did you, have you seen that like help with you know these competitions and races like kind of being able to draw back to you know uh your experiences in the seal teams you know i'm actually the one thing I'm, I'm pretty good at dealing with sleep deprivation. I don't know if it's because mm-hmm. I went from the SEAL teams to immediately being a dad, because that's like mm-hmm. my ass probably more <laughs> than anything. <you> know? <laughs> that's but, true, yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, just between that, I feel like my whole life is sleep deprivation, man. That's kind of, mm-hmm. I'm just used to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. And then like, looking back, uh, whenever Atlas, the first year Atlas was born, my oldest son, um, I was kind of the stay at home dad. And then when Jerry would get home from work, that was my time to go work then. So I would, I would hand the Atlas off to Jerry and I'd head out with the dogs. And then I would try to get home in time before she left for work the next day. So there was, there was weeks where I was only getting five hours of sleep for the entire week. And, and just to, you know, keep the, the, the dream alive, you know, I, I wanted to do the, I did a run. I needed to knock out some of my qualifiers and that's just what it took to, to get there. So that's kind of, I've just been yeah, uh, absolutely yeah. So just you, I've just and actually that's kind of good training, you know. Got me used to being half zombie like on the back of a dog sled and everything. <laughs> but so, what's your worst experience? Like, what is some of the craziest, gnarliest stuff that you got into as a dog musher? I know you've told me a few stories. So, like, what is some of the like holy shit? I almost didn't make it out of this, or you know, I've had you know like frostbite or close to having frostbite. What what's some of the kind of the crazier stories you have? Yeah, so the most recent one was actually during the, the Quest 300. Uh, there's a, a summit that you climb. It's a 3,000, I think it's like a 3,600-foot summit that you have to go up and over with the dogs. And Eagle Summit in particular is known for having really bad weather. It seems that I think it has really high-pressure system on one side and low pressure on the other side. And sometimes when they meet, it creates this huge wind event that happens and seems to just be located right on top of the the mountain there and it can change in a matter of of minutes up there anyway i got into the first checkpoint or second checkpoint of the race and i was in dead last because i was running a team of really young dogs and i was taking a lot of extra rest and i was right where i wanted to be and uh, but i was dead last everybody left and i and they were probably about an hour ahead of me and as I was getting ready to leave, somebody comes down Eagle Summit on a snow machine and was like, are you getting ready to head up right now? And I was like, that's the plan. And they're like, it's really bad up there. It's There's like a bad storm coming in. I actually was up there taking pictures and I couldn't couldn't stay up there anymore. I had to come back down. The The trail that the snow machine would have put in was gone. So they're like, don't 
don't think that there's going to be a trail. There's no, you can't see the next trail marker. It's, it's getting bad up there. So I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I decided, you know, I better booty the dogs. We better get, go out now and, and we'll see what the heck it's like first person. Cause like where we were at, at the checkpoint, it was beautiful, like bluebird skies and then off in the distance, it was like, um, the, the mountain Eagle summit was kind of in a gray haze. You, I mean, it didn't look like it was that bad from where we were at. Anyway, we took off going and we, it was a, a, kind of like on a flat trail for maybe a mile. And then it starts climbing. And once we started climbing, it started, I get, get hit with a, a gust of wind every now and then. But then as we kept going up, it get, got worse and worse and worse and visibility started deteriorating to the point to where I couldn't see the next trail marker. There's little posts, little wooden posts with a reflective sticker on it that kind of helps like God, make sure you're on the right trail. And in this area, I'm going up Eagle Summit, there's no trees. It's all like tundra essentially. So you're, if there's no trail, you don't know where you're going or what, and if you go off the wrong, the wrong finger off the side of the mountain in the wrong spot, you're, you're screwed because then you're in the deep snow and now you, now you, it's getting out of there is, going to be really tough so you have to pay really close attention on making sure you're on the right the right trail there and we, i was losing a trail marker so i eventually stopped the team and i set my snow hook and the snow hook is like essentially emergency brake and i started walked out in front of the team and i found the next trail marker but then i turned around to look at my dogs and i couldn't see my dog team now because it just kept the, the the visibility kept deteriorating so now i'm starting to like get worried i can't get too far ahead of my dog team because i might lose them and I can't see the, where I'm supposed to go next. So I just sat there for a second. Like, I don't know what the heck I'm supposed to do in this situation. Uh, <laughs> and I sat there for a second. Like, I have a leash in my bag. I So what I did is I ended up uh, clipping my leash into my collar of my lead dogs. And I became my lead dog then. And I just started walking kind of in a snake pattern trying to find the next uh, trail marker. I finally found one, but it took me like 15 minutes to find it. And I sat there again and I was like, this is not working out that well. And it's like, if I turn around and head back to the checkpoint, my race is over because I'm already in last place. And now I'm just way too far behind. So they'll withdraw me. It's like, turn around is not really an option. And I look back at my dogs at this point. Now they're all in one giant ball, like huddled up. And they're looking at me like this wind is bad. And it's, it's like the wind is blowing bad. Now it's, it's uh, like knocking me off and trying to, I'm trying to blow me off the side of the mountain. I actually had um, ski poles to, so, cause when I'm on the back of the sled, I lot, like to work and help the dogs out with ski poles. I had two ski poles sunk into the snow here. And all of a sudden I looked at them. They went, <clears throat> the wind blew them right off the, off the side of the mountain after the, even though they were staked into the snow, that's how heavy it was blowing up there. And so I stretched the dogs out and I couldn't, and I got back to the sled and I couldn't see my front four dogs. So I couldn't see my lead dogs and I couldn't see the two dogs behind my lead dogs. And that we started going a little bit and my dogs stopped. They wouldn't go anymore. And then that, they turned around and they all got back in a huddle and they just looked at me like they were afraid. I was like, damn it, this is not good. Like, we might have to turn around. And I started thinking, did you ever meet my dog, Brock? Yeah, yeah. So I remember thinking, like, oh, I wish I had Brock here because Brock is one of the – he's a very special dog. He's a, one of the most intelligent dogs I think anybody would ever meet. Um, super intelligent dog. Anyway, I was thinking, I wish I had Brock here right now. I could put him in single lead by himself, and he would just drag us up the side of the mountain, and he would have no problem finding the trail markers. And I had no, my, my two lead dogs that I had at the time didn't want to go in this, in the wind, but I had one of Brock's pups that was only three years old and didn't have much leader experience. Like, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm just going to put him up there to see what happens. So I put him up front with a uh, little buttercup, tiny little buttercup. She's a little 30 pound dog. And I ho hooked him up, uh, lined the dogs out. So the, the line was tight coming off the, the sled and I walked back to the sled then the line stayed tight, which was a good sign. Even though I couldn't see uh, Maverick, which was Brock's pup, and Buttercup, I couldn't see them. But the, the tight, the line was tight, so I knew they were holding the line out. So I pulled the hook off, and I said, "All right, ready." And that's the command to get the dogs up off the snow. And I say, "Let's go." And that's the command for them to start moving forward. So I, when I said, "Let's go," we started inching forward. And I was like, "I don't know. I'll go for 15 minutes, and if I don't see a trail marker, I'm going to have to stop and figure something out." But we were going five minutes went by and we passed the trail marker. Still can't see the front four dogs. And we kept going a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, trail marker. And then we really started climbing. And as we got started getting higher and higher and higher, we finally got to like three quarters of the way up. And it, and it kind of visibility opened up a little bit. 
And I could see my front two dogs, Maverick and Buttercup, their noses were to the ground and they were sniffing for like yellow snow or dog turds or booty from another team. That's how they were able to keep us on the right track and on the right, right trail. And they got us up over that, that mountain. And when we got down on the other side, it was cause we got in a different uh, pressure system down there where it was kind of cleared out then. And when we got down on the other side, the whole dynamic of the team changed. They were like, mm-hmm charging hard they were no longer like afraid of anything we would have some sections of open water past that and they would just lower their head and 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 blaze right through it that was actually um the second half of the whole race we were faster than the first half of the race and i think it's because once they got through that storm they realized that like i wasn't going to ask them to do something they weren't capable of and they were just like focused it was it was that the change that happened with the team was something i wish everyone could have experienced it was so so drastic and so crazy that the dogs were like, man, it was, it was something to see. That's, that's crazy. Cause then you speak to like the intelligence of the dogs, you know, and like, and the, their determination, I'm mean, like, humans have that too. It's like, you've experienced something worse. So then on the other side, you're like, ah, this is fine. We'll just charge right through it. And you're seeing that with the animals and the dogs. I mean, is that, is that, I mean, that's just, that's insane. Before that, so just to preface it a little bit, before we went up and over that hill, we would come across some open sections of water. So like there's overflow along some of the creeks and the rivers that happen. And overflow is like, as the ice gets thicker, as, as the winter progresses and it gets colder, it displaces the water from, from underneath it up to the top of it. Or if they get a bunch of snow and if you're on a lake or something, it, all that weight in the center kind of pushes this, the ice down and puts, creates water to come over top of it. Um, so there was a couple sections of overflow where my dogs did not want to go through it. So I had to like essentially become the lead dog and walk and show them, like, it's all right, guys, come on, come on. So we had to stop at every single, every single section that there would be a little bit of open water and I'd have to go through it first and then they would follow me. Uh, but then after that, they would charge through anything. It was, it was, it was like I had a completely different dog team after going through that. It was pretty So crazy. what's the challenge? That's that. That's yeah. That's wild. So so, what's the challenge? Is that you've done the th- the three hundred miles, and then you did her out as a thousand. So that means obviously, you know, you're doing three times the work. What's that schedule going to be like? Is that just something that's just part of the race where you are like you're going to be sleep deprived for the next nine days or ten days or whatever yeah. you're doing? Like, what's that planning process? You know, because there is a point where you're like, all right, I gotta I gotta at least get like two to three hours of rest here, you know, or or something like that. Is there you know, the way you're planning it, you know, this is new to you as well. You know, is there something that some of the old timers have kind of talked to you about or wh- wh- how do you prep for that? Yeah. So the Iditarod's a completely different beast um, compared to the, these th- mid distance races, the 300 and 200 milers that I've done. Um, the biggest difference is there's, you're not going to, you're going to take a longer rest than you would in in these smaller races. So these shorter races, sometimes you only take three, four hours of rest at a time. The rule of thumb for the Iditarod is you rest equal to what you run. So if you run 50 miles and it takes you five, six hours, then you're gonna rest five to six hours. And and you just kind of repeat that all the way to the finish line. Um, That's gonna put you in the back of the pack. But as someone like me who doesn't have a whole lot of, uh, who's still really green in the world of dog mushing, that's what you Mm want to do. You don't want to kind of, you're you're not going to compete with the top mushers in the game your first go. So like, there's a lot of things you need to learn and stuff. Just like me getting up over that hill. Like I learned so much and there's so much that the dogs need to learn because they haven't done anything like that. So not only am I a rookie, but all my dogs are rookies in this endeavor too. So it's going to be, uh, we're going to be towards the back of the pack in the Iditarod, but that's going to be all part of the plan. We're going to, I'm going to run super conservative, take a lot of extra rest. Um, so like the, the, the nice thing is when you run a schedule like that, each time I camp out the dogs and we rest, I'll probably at least get two to three hours of sleep, a rest myself then doing that versus some of the top tiers or they're going to top tier teams. They're going to, they're going to be cut and rest. You know, they're going to be, they know what their dogs can do and can't do. And, and so that's, I'm not going to be able to compete with that yet. So down the road, mm-hmm. who knows what I'll be able to do, but not for the first one. First one, I'm going to be taking a lot yeah. of extra rest. So basically this, this kind of the first go around is like, let's just get this done. Let's get it finished. And yeah, then as I'm the gonna player like progresses. Out there. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. be like a sponge yeah. out there trying to learn as much as I can from the veterinarians, trying to learn as much as I can from the, from the Iditarod vets that, that have done this several different times. You know, there's always, every time I do a, a race, even if it's a 200, 300 mile race, I learn so much from other mushers out there that have been doing this 
you know, some of these people have been doing it since they were like this big, you know, since the time they were a kid. So, uh, man, there's, there's a wealth of knowledge out there amongst the other mushers. And I try to pick up the things I like and, and, and build upon that, you know, and try to come back better than the next, the next race. So. So now, so which is awesome. I'm, I'm super pumped for you for doing this next year, the Iditarod. So as your career progresses, like, where do you, I don't want to say, where do you see this going? But like, is this something that you're like, Hey, you know, I want to be able to, I want to compete every year and start moving up the slots. Like where does kind of the future hold for dog mushers? You know, like guys, a lot of veterans get out, they start companies, they, you know, go do this, go do that, you know, like all this other stuff. So where do you, you see this as your kind of like career path? Like, Hey, I want to keep doing this for a long time. I love what I do. You know, where, where it's, what's the goals that you, you kind of set for yourself for in dog mushing. Yeah. The, our, our goals are kind of like constantly evolving. I feel like as a dog mm-hmm. mushers, um, from the time this has been in our head and the time we like, you know, from just like the, the thought was just as a little seed into where it is now, the goal has always been the Iditarod and, uh, haven't really thought much past that. Um, cause it took, it takes a lot of work and a lot of time, mm-hmm. a lot of building to just to get to this point. And, uh, so once we, once we finish the Iditarod, I don't know what we'll do. Um, dog mushing is not something that you're going to make a lot of money on. Honestly, it's, it's, Mm -hmm. it's something you do because you, you love the lifestyle. So dog mushing is very much a lifestyle. It's not something you can just dip your toes into and, and, uh, expect it to go well because it's it's a full-time commitment you know kind of like farming you know you have all these animals out there that need constant exercise they need fed twice a day they need to poop scoop doesn't matter if it's a nice sunny day or if it's blowing snow at 45 below zero the dogs all need all the stuff they need to to, you know to be happy healthy animals and and uh, so it's more of a lifestyle than anything and that's what I'm one thing I've realized is I fell in love with the lifestyle, not so much the racing. The racing's mm-hmm. cool, but it's like icing on the cake. I mean, uh, dog mushing in general, just having a dog. I don't see myself getting out of dogs for a long mm-hmm. time. I maybe after the Iditarod, I may go a different route and do more um, do more uh, bush traveling and and go into remote villages and meeting different people. I don't really know what I'll do after the Iditarod. You know, I might or I'll. I might get bit by the, the racing bug where I just want to keep, keep doing it. Uh, one thing is I do have some other races that I would like to do the, other than the Iditarod. Uh, one of them being the Kobuk 440, which is a race above the Arctic Circle and Costa to view mm-hmm. goes to Kobuk and back. And, and I, that's going to be on the, the, definitely on the, the to-do list eventually, but. Hell yeah. So how is that then, you know, like I said, this, it's incredibly intensive, the, the dog mushing, the time, the schedule, what's that like, you know, uh, balancing that with a, with a family, you know, um, as we're getting older, like I, I just talked with Marty Scovlin, who's a, a journalist and, you know, and, and, I, you know, even with my journey in filmmaking and media, like we're in our like mid thirties now, <laughs> you know, we're not, we aren't the, the mid twenties, late twenties, like you said, start with a blank slate, take the wife, like, all right, let's rock and roll. Let's go, you know, let's go hop on a plane. Let's go move to Alaska. You know, how is that balancing, you know, your passion with the family and your give and take and, you know, and all that stuff. Yeah. Kids having kids definitely makes, makes it more challenging. You know, it, it's not like I look back at the first few years up here when I'd had no kids and I could just wake up and put all my effort into the dogs. You know, that those were the easy days. Now, uh, now with kids and everything that kids are definitely the priority and, and that means the dogs and the training take a kind of a backseat to that. Uh, what that really means for me and people that follow me are that it, chances of me ever winning races are probably non-existent because I'm going to be competing against people that don't have kids and can 100% fully focus on Mm -hmm. that job. And you can't, you can't beat people like that unless you're willing to do that either too. Mm -hmm. So, uh, that's the big thing I realize is to ever come out with a, a, I did a rod win or a mid distance win is going to take, a lot of sacrifice on my end and not just my end, my family's end too. So it's mm-hmm. d- depending on what, how, you know, is that worth, worth, worth the squeeze? I don't really know. So that's kind of the big thing that I've realized that is the sense having kids and having a family. That's kind of like the big, big thing I realized. Also it, it, it takes away. Um, I have a relatively small number of dogs compared to most kennels 
out there that are running these long distance races. I, I have 25 dogs and that's including every four legged creature that I have total. Um, but mm-hmm. when it comes to sled dogs, I only have 18 of them, which is actually a really small number of sled dogs to be training from. Doesn't leave me a big, deep bench compared to some of these kennels that have, you know, they're training 40, 50, 60 dogs. They have a big, deep bench to pull from. I, I just don't have those numbers because I can't, I just can't with having kids and everything, just not enough, not enough manpower in a day. Maybe when the kids get older, that might help play in my advantage. You know, it's kind of, yeah. you know, go out and f- free labor right there. So yeah, I was say, yeah, yeah. Play free labor. Labor down the road. But. <laughs> yeah. So is that, is that, how is that then raising kids in general up in Alaska? How is that uh, different from say your fit, you know, your in-laws or your friends that are, you know, enjoying the, the lower 48, you know, being able to get Amazon and, and, 12 hours and going to Costco to pick up diapers. <laughs> you know, I, the cool thing about two rivers is I'm only about 45 minutes to an hour outside of Fairbanks. So if I need, you know, anything, Fairbanks has everything you need. It has, you know, Walmart, Home Depot, Lowe's, Costco, all that stuff. So if I need stuff, I can just go in town and, and, uh, and get the supplies that I need. But the nice thing is I'm far enough away that I don't have to deal with the stuff that happens in town. And, and we're kind of like right on the edge of being in the wilderness. So like much past two rivers, there's not anything out there. And uh, it's nice. I think it's like you get kind of the best of both worlds. You have a little bit of civilization and you have the wilderness out your back door. So my kids, since the time they were, I mean, Atlas, since the time Atlas was a little baby in a bassinet swing, and we, we had a litter of puppies a week before he was born. So when he was born, we would always put him in his bassinet and then wrap, put a bunch of puppies around him. So the, from the time he was a little kid, man, he's been surrounded by dogs and puppies. And now that's like he, he just loves dogs. And he loves going out on, on dog mushing and, and rides. And we, he goes out with me really up until it's – colder if as long as it's not colder than 20 below he, he's been on rides with me so mm-hmm. <laughs> so do you see him doing any any of that when he gets older is he kind of taken to it a little bit it's gonna be up to them man it's up to if they yeah, want to yeah. they're gonna have the the resources available to them to do it if they aren't into it i'm not gonna force them to do it because like i said man this is uh it's a lifestyle you can't really just just mm-hmm. like dip your toes in it once in a while like you either all in or you're all out Mm-hmm. So is that something too? I mean, like said so the 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 lifestyle of the outdoors. I mean, that's a pretty big step away from what people, you know, it, like I said in the lower forty eight or just in general and culture. I mean, do you see that? Like, you, you're pretty pumped to be raising your family out in you know the wilderness and kind of getting back to it, opposed to you know diving into you know the you know I won't say the politics of today, but you know it all the kind of the madness that goes on you know within the city and and you know dealing with school boards and all that kind of stuff is that do you you feel kind of like you're heading in there you know it's a it's a nice to be out you know away from all that you know especially with a family now a hundred percent um the biggest uh i guess when i realized how much i that that is a benefit is during covid when covid first mm-hmm. hit it well, and really all of COVID, it changed my life this much. My life changed mm-hmm. this much because of COVID. Um, I was able to keep doing what I was doing in Alaska. Like very few things shut down. Um, the most it was like, yeah, Alaska kept going, man. That's the that's the one thing that that you just don't have the whole uh, the political nonsense up here. There's no really keeping up with the Joneses. Like you want to talk about Southern hospitality, I'll tell you what, Alaska hospitality, there's nothing like it, man. It's like you go to a remote village. That's one of my favorite parts about these, uh, these races. You go to these remote places in, in, in Alaska, the welcome party is, is insane. They bring out all the best food that they can make and you get a warm welcome and it's pretty awesome. The people are very friendly up here, man. I don't know, man. There's not much that I don't like about Alaska since I've been up here. And uh, a friend of mine told me that it's not so much that Alaska grows on you, is it that it just makes you unfit to live anywhere else? Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> That's great. I love that. Dude. Yeah. I mean, I, I, like I said, I, I love that aspect of like hearing how you guys are, are living up there, you know, especially like hunting and like, you know, you guys still have careers too, you know, like I said, your wife still has a career, you have, you know, a career in dog mushing, you have a family, but it's just that those priorities shift. And it's always cool hearing you talk about that where, you know, like for me, it's like, yeah, I'd like to get a honey and, you know, I, I don't know if I'll find the time, but with you guys, it's like you hunt and that's a huge part of your diet for the next three, four months. So there's no, like, we don't know if I'm going to get out with my dad to go shoot a few grouse, you know, in the fall during MEA weekend. It's like, no, we're going to go hunt elk. We are hunting, you know, whatever else so that we have food on the table throughout the winter, you know, like that, that type of stuff is just like, it's, it's super cool to hear about and being like, how do you, you know, especially getting your kind of your priorities straight, you know, being, and especially getting that type of awesome, healthy meat, you know, up there. I know that's kind of a big thing in the culture now is, is hunting. And then uh, also just, you know, being able to go kill your own food and, and quarter it and whatnot. And then the th hundreds of pounds that you get, you know, it, that you throw in your freezer and you have it for months, six months, eight months at a time. You know, we kind of grew up doing that, you know, in Minnesota where we'd get like quarter or get a cow, you know, I mean, maybe my wife are thinking about doing that now is just like paying for half a cow and then throwing it in the freezer. But I got to imagine that it's way more gratifying shooting, you know, like I said, an elk or a bear or whatever you guys hunt to <laughs> and, and be like, yep, this is it. We're set for the next, you know, six, eight months here, you know? So, you know, is that something that you guys like uh, definitely like, like love partaking in. I mean, I loved going up there and, and, and doing the salmon run with you guys. That was, you know, that in general was holy, holy shit. You'd be able to like feed your family for months just on the salmon that you guys caught. So is that something that you guys are just like, I don't know if we can get away from that, you know, like when you go visit family back in Pennsylvania, is that like, just like, you know, you guys don't get to go out and, you know, catch giant 20 pound fish or, you know, or, uh, you know, massive elk to get your food. Is that something that you guys just love doing? Oh yeah. And I, I honestly think part of it is when you are self-reliant, th that is the most free you'll ever be. You don't have to rely on anybody else to, to supply anything for you. And that includes your boss. Like a lot of people will have jobs and stuff, but they're relying on their boss to keep their job. If they lose their job. They have to go find a different one. The way we live is more like, okay, we can kind of like, I can go out and cut down trees and there's the heating bill paid. And if I, we get mm -hmm. hungry, we have a freezer full of, of meat that we just killed. 90, I'd say 90% of our diet is, is wild game that we, we harvest. And so it, when you live like that, you cut out times and blocks of time to go out and, and hunt and to go out and fish. And actually the cool thing was whenever you guys came up, uh, when was that? Was that two years ago now? Two summers yeah, ago? Yeah, I think it's 2020. 20, uh, 2020, yeah. So three, yeah. Years, three years ago now? Yeah, yeah. holy shit. But like, I don't yeah, know if it was the yeah. first day or was it the two days that we didn't catch anything. And I was like starting to like, oh, man, this is not looking good. And then the last day we were there, uh, me mm. and Steven caught like 40 fish in four hours. So uh, it, it can change like that. And we filled our freezer out for the summer then. And then later on that winter, we ended up getting a caribou or two. And, and, uh, then at the end of the winter, we ended up getting a moose and that's how we kind of fed all through the summer. And then, yeah, so it's, we take out chunks of time where we, we go out to hunt and specifically for food or take out specific blocks of time to go and harvest firewood and, and, uh, live, yeah, life is simple when you think about all that you need. You need shelter, water, and food. And if you can get it all on your own, you yeah. really don't need much from anybody else. Then. <laughs> I love that. That's awesome, bro. That's I'm so pumped. I'm so pumped for you. So, you, when do you plan it? When is the Iditarod then for 2024? Um, like, what 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 are those dates? The Iditarod's always the first weekend in March. So the first week, first Saturday in March will be the ceremonial run and that's in downtown Anchorage. And it's just like a parade, a way to celebrate the dogs and dog mushing and the history of dog mushing in Alaska. And, uh, yeah, the dogs just run a little course through downtown Anchorage. And then mm -hmm. that next day they, the real race starts and that starts in, in Willow, um, which is about an hour and a half, two hours North of, of Anchorage. That's where the real, mm -hmm. and that starts on Sunday, first Sunday okay, of I'll March. We, in order awesome. to get to the Iditarod, uh, we have different, we're going to be doing several races next year in effort to train up for the Iditarod. So mm -hmm. a perfect world for me would be January. We'd be doing a 200 to 300 mile race. February, we'd be doing the Yukon Quest 300 again, maybe the 550. 
and then the Iditarod in March. And then if every if we, if we can get the fundraising for it, we do the Cobuck 440 after the Iditarod then. That's kind of how we have it in my head, at least, that how it, it would work out. And the nice thing is whenever you do these races, there's a lot of lot. There's not a lot. I wouldn't say a lot, but there's some luck involved in finishing the uh, um, these races because there's some things that the dogs can have happen. They can get sick. Uh, there's certain things that are out of the musher's control that can happen. It would cause you to uh, not finish the race. And I had a dog team get sick on me before in a mid distance race and they just stop eating. And if the dogs aren't eating, they have no fuel to keep running. So mm-hmm. in order to help them get used to like the sickness used to try to get them exposed to as much of the bugs that they can be exposed to prior to the race. So that's, what's nice about these other races leading up to the I did rod. They get exposed to dog teams from all over the world. You know, even these mid distance races, you have dog teams from the lower 48 from, uh, Norway to Sweden to Germany, like all these dogs coming from all over the place, getting them in the mix with all these other dogs, help them get exposed to any bugs that can, they can pick up on the trail prior to going to the Iditarod. So that way that's hopefully one thing you don't have to have to worry about during the, the big race. So that's kind of looking into next year, like kind of like a brief goal of what we'd like to do, get a few mid distance races under a belt prior to the Iditarod. Awesome. Yeah. And we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up here, but we'll also kind of tag this on in the end. So, um, I know you guys get sponsors or you, you have people sponsor your teams is when does that open up just so that, you know, this podcast should be out within the next few months. Um, and, and I'll definitely like to clip it so that we can kind of get you guys in the right direction, at least for, you know, some sponsors and, and, and whatnot. So I know you guys have, uh, sponsors for the team. Where can they find that? Or, you know, how, how does your sponsorship work? Our sponsorship works. We we give out individual dog sponsors. So each dog we have has a sponsor, and we start that at the start of the season. And our our training starts September first. So September first is when we open up all of our dog sponsors, and you can find out all the information on that either on our website at frozen trident dot com or on my uh, social media uh, frozen trident on Instagram. Awesome. Cool. And do you have any other supplemental sponsors as well? I mean, you know, for some of the races, like I know, you know, what does that cover for that, that when someone sponsors one of your dogs, uh, what does that cover for the, for the team? So, uh, dog mushing is, man, it's an expensive sport. You know, you go through booties, each dog wears a booty on each paw. And, uh, you, let's say you do, a a um, I mean, you're going through thousands of booties for the Iditarod and each, each booty is like a dollar fifty two dollars So uh, just there, you're, you have several thousand dollars wrapped up in just booties and you have to fly and ship them out of there. And not to mention dog food. Uh, we're probably going to have to get two tons, literally two tons of meat to cut up meat snacks, uh, to get, so there's no roads in or out of Nome, which is the finish line of the Iditarod. So now you have to fly all your dogs back out of there and you get a bunch of the, the, uh, travel kennels and then pay for the airfare to get out of there. Plus you have to get lodging at these races. I, a friend of mine told me don't expect to do the, I did rod for anything less than 20 to $25,000. So oh, wow. all the sponsorship goes to getting the right dog food or, or not the dog food. Cause we have a great sponsor for uh, dog food, uh, team dog, Mike, Mike Ritland company gives us our dog food, which is an awesome, awesome company, awesome dog food. And, but then we still got meat snacks. We still got booties. We still got, you know, the airfare and travel and, and all that. And it's a, it's definitely not, not a cheap, cheap endeavor to take on. <laughs> yeah. But that's cool though. So basically people can go onto your website and be able to sponsor dogs for, for the year. And, and then they could also sponsor a dog. Be like, yeah, I, I, I sponsor a dog that went onto the Iditarod. So, you know, that, <laughs> that's yeah. also a little, little, little feather in your cap that you can you can put on there <laughs> yeah and then uh, our sponsors get a big thank you box at the end after the the season ends and then we also do a uh, kind of like a, a email each month kind of letting the sponsors know what's going on with the team how the dogs are looking kind of what's going right what's not going so right problems and mm-hmm. trials and triumphs and all that stuff that we kind of keep the sponsors in and loop more than just my social media so Awesome. Sounds good. Well, dude, I, I appreciate you coming on. Is there uh, where can everyone reach you again? Just so we can iterate where they can go get sponsors and then where they can find you on social media. The best way is to hit me up on social media and that's uh, frozen trident on Instagram. 
Okay. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for coming on, brother. I appreciate it. This is an awesome conversation. Um, and, uh, look forward to seeing you, you know, racing in Alaska and, uh, stay safe. <laughs> Sounds good, buddy. <laughs>